pleased to welcome Antonio back to the studio to uh, talk about all things legal today from the Alicante Lawyers. Remember uh, always to uh, check out the website alicantelawyers.es, Pelitha and Heredia. Good to see you, Antonio. Good to see you too. We've had a good old long chat in the studio about what we might talk about today, <laughs> yes. including your ventures to the UK as well. Which That's true. Uh, you, you, you did say that the food wasn't something that you found that, that brilliant when you lived in UK. Well, not the typical British food, I guess. The fish, of, the fish and chips was okay, I guess. And I did like the restaurants, though. They had good options. But typical British food, probably not for my, not my cup of tea. No, you don't like a Sunday brunch? A Sunday mm, lunch? Even, not, right? no? not really. The roast and such. No, not, not, not for you. It's, it's the boiled vegetables, I think. They, <laughs> they, they don't do it for me. <laughs> the overboiled vegetables. Yeah, phew, yeah that's too much. Absolutely. Um, so you're the expert, then, on property and conveyancing and things like that. Yes, that's true. We are a team of several lawyers, as you know, and three of us, Sandra, Daniel and I, are specialised in conveyancing. We have to talk, before we get on to uh, anything to do with property, about the uh, finalisation of La Renta, the uh, tax, uh, which has to be done by the end of this month. I know you're laughing at my Spanish up there. No, no, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It's true. The end, is, the end is nigh. The end is coming. If you're hearing this, you haven't done your tax return, your renta, then you are already running a little bit late, so you should definitely check up with whoever does this for you. That's by, so by the end of the month, that's uh, when it has to be in. Uh, and also then coming up, because it's never ending taxes, is it really? Um, the quarterly uh, tax uh, comes up for people who are freelance, autonomous. That's right. If you are a freelancer and you do your VAT invoices and such, from the 1st until the 20th of July is the time for you to do it. Also, if you are a company, you do the quarterly as well. And if you rent in a tourist uh, fashion with a tourist license, then you can do your quarterly uh, tax return for that if you want, unless you've chosen to do the yearly. You can do it yearly as well. Okay. Yes, they change it. Yes. Uh, plenty going on with property again in Spain. We see cranes everywhere. It's almost like we're back to pre-financial crisis times, isn't it? There is so much going on. Um, how difficult is it for people from overseas to get their head around sorting out buying a property here? Things like uh, we want to focus on today, powers of attorney, which you can do either from your home country or for Spain. Which is better? Oh, that's a great question. It's true. If you live abroad and you want to buy a property here in Spain, even if you want to move here or you just wanted a holiday home or an investment, then it's typical for you to hire somebody to do it for you, normally a lawyer. Better if it's an independent lawyer. And the first thing that this person is going to tell you is, please sign me a power of attorney. Basically for the following thing, which is obtaining an NI number for you. Because you can always come for completion if the completion is set in a stone. Although giving a power of attorney to allow somebody to do completion for you, it's definitely a good idea. You can do the power of attorney from your home country or from Spain. The main difference is the things you can do with the power of attorney. Technically, you can do almost anything with a power of attorney. You can have somebody deputized to marry somebody on your behalf with a power of attorney. You can give a property away with a power of attorney. You can get the mortgage, sell, almost, you know, get a digital signature, almost anything. If, you know, depending on what the draft of the board of attorney contains. But there's a major difference between a, a, a board of attorney signed in your home country and one in Spain. And it's the NI number application. It seems, sounds a little bit weird, but most of the times that you use a board of attorney, you use it either at the notary to buy, mm -hmm. sell, or you use it at court to sue or reply to a lawsuit, or you use it at one of the normal offices like utility companies, tax office. All of them accept both nationals and uh, foreign powers of attorney, but the police station. The police station is the one that issues the NIE number, and they've uh, changed their requirements. They are becoming tougher and tougher, and they no longer accept a power of attorney signed abroad unless you sign it at the Spanish consulate or embassy. They will only accept powers of attorney signed in Spain, at least here in Alicante. Right, so that changes the, uh, the th changes things around a little bit because a lot of people come over, you know, they find the property they want, they go back to their home country to uh, either set themselves up or, uh, to move or even to uh, sort out buying their holiday property. That's true, and that's a new pressure for these um, prospective buyers, which is, that's, that's exactly, you know, you think, mm, I'm going to buy a property in Spain, you line up with an agent or you come on your own, depending on what kind of adventure you want, and then you come, you see several properties. Maybe you made a decision on the spot, but maybe 
did you do not? There's mm. one, two, three that you like, or maybe none of them, and then you move back and you've made a mistake. If you lie from a country that is close by, you know, you're French or you're, you're from the Netherlands, then that's okay. You can maybe, maybe come back to give power of attorney. But you, are, if you are from further abroad, uh, further abroad, could be the UK, slightly further. USA even. All right, that's what States, I was going yeah. for. If you're mm. Canadian from the USA, Australian, or any of the other countries, then coming back is definitely a no-go and then you're stuck in which you cannot apply for your NA number easily. Either you do it at your Spanish consulate or embassy back home or you have to come back here to give a port of attorney. So it's better for people to come already with their research already done. If you know you're going to buy something even if you're unsure of what's going to be, it could be better to set up a meeting with your lawyer or your future lawyer, which could be very well, and then on that appointment, arrange to give them a power of attorney. You can instruct them not to use it at all. Obviously, they won't. Any lawyer would respect that until you give them orders. But you've planted the seed for you to be able to buy your property of your dreams later and obtain that really hard-to-get NA number. And certainly you'd have to think in the, the current market, today's market, properties are going rather quickly, aren't they? Oh, yeah. They come up and, and, and then you know, the next day you think, wow, the sign's gone down again already. That's right. I'm going to tell you a short story about that precisely that happened to me this week. So I had a client. She's a Dutch lady living close to Ondon de las Nieves, which is not close to Javier, but, you know, it's a small inland town uh, alongside uh, Alicante, inland. And she was looking for a property for some time and she found one that she liked in Ondon and she placed an offer. Then the seller uh, had an, a second offer and says, well, if you pay above market price, then maybe you get it. And she raised the price, which is already a little bit unusual. She raised the price and offered 5,000 euros more, and she got it. But the lady, the seller, freaked out because she realized she was selling the property too quickly. She only put it on the market three days prior, mm. and she was wanting to sell her property to buy something else. And she couldn't find something else to buy that quickly, mm -hmm. so she had to cancel the sale before it even started. And this woman was left without the property. Now, we move forward three months. These, the potential, the Dutch woman that was looking to buy a property doesn't find anything else that, you know, she likes as much as she liked that property. And then the seller puts it in the market again. Probably she found another property, but has increased the price in 25,000 euros. Yeah, of course. That's how quick the market's moving at the moment. Yeah. Now, to top up, the buyer, the Dutch woman, made the offer and got the property three months later than she wanted and for 30,000 euros more. That's how crazy the market is at the time. Uh, that's a very good example. Um, yeah, you know, you have to move quickly. Uh, it's strange because um, quite often I've heard a few stories where uh, different agents might say, oh, look, see how quickly this could sell. Uh, I think we probably undervalued it. Let's go for more. And you get that scenario. That's right. Because the way this evaluating or, you know, gorging how much a property is worth mm. is really half science, half magic. What people will pay. That's right, yeah. because it's the market, isn't it? So you can, if one, as you said, if one seller raises the price for one property, then if there is a seller's market, as there is now, and there is a shortage of properties, it will go to that price quickly because people are desperate or they're becoming desperate because they cannot really uh, find something that they like mm -hmm. and then, you know, the rest of the agents see it. Or at least the same agent thought, well, if I sold this one for this price, then this one, this one, this one, and this one I could definitely raise. I'm going to sell them anyway and the, the seller is going to be very happy. I can raise my commission because I'm making such a good sale and so on and so forth. But, you know, it's a loop. Yeah. Um, do you think the market is is going to continue ri uh, ri rising? It, and there's no sign of a, a bubble or a limit, is there yet? Really, I haven't seen it. Well, m bear in mind that although I do deal with the, these properties, if I knew exactly how properties are going to behave, <laughs> yeah. I would be filthy rich. But it looks that way, at least in my personal experience. At the office, buying and selling properties still increasing. I've rarely have encountered a property that I have a client buying that the seller paid more for it or the same amount when they bought it even if it was 
Oli one, two, or three years ago. So yes, property yeah, prices are increasing. When we were talking just before, you've you've seen some quite major increases in yeah. property prices in say just three to four years. That's right. Yes, I there's a, uh, something that I've noticed that happens particularly here in Javier, and is that people that bought a property 2021, 2022 for any reason that well, if you, unbeknownst to me, they've decided to sell it and they've bought it, let's say, for two hundred and fifty thousand euros, and now they're selling at least for three hundred twenty five thousand or three hundred and fifty. When you, you know, to the agent you ask, well, how about changes? You've refurbished, you've changed the kitchen, you know, to, for the property to gain value. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they is rack even, as like, not that they know of, they just as they bought it. So the property's not been improved at all, but it's worth that more because the market has uh, gone right. up so much. That's right. That's not bad, is it? It's, a, it's good if you've had that as perhaps an investment, or maybe you've got two apartments and you're selling one of them. But if you have, to, if you're looking at buying in the same area, you're in the same boat, aren't you? Because basically, whatever you want to buy next is going to be also at a higher price. That's right. Doing the chance of selling a property to buy one of an equivalent price with the same money no longer works. You can downsize, which is something typical to do, particularly if you're yeah. a certain age. We have a in Ondon, this time I was talking about, we do rentas, which we were talking about before mm-hmm. as well. I'm one, one of the persons that go there with the people at the office and, you know, handle the clients. They are, most of them, 70 plus years old, obviously, because Ondon is an old town, an old village, and people bought there 20, 30, 40 years ago. And there's a current there, if you are 70 something and you have maybe, I don't know, four or 5,000 square meter plot, which you can get in the campo, right? As the garden is going to be too much probably yeah. for you. So you're looking to downsize, sell that, and buy a small small house, a small casita, or a, an apartment in, in the city centre. So, you know, you'll be closer to the sh- to the shops and the streets and such, a little bit more of a, of a, of a life, you know, with, with your fellow neighbours. And also, why not, a slightly cheaper. You will get an extra. You'll sell your property, which is bigger, to an eager new buyer, mm-hmm. and then you'll buy something cheaper, so you'll have a few extra to enjoy on your golden years. Gives you years. a little bit of a nest egg as well for, uh, yeah, of for, course. for, for yes. later retirement. Uh, That's true. So I think we covered most things with power of attorney. Are there any other major differences between uh, <clears throat> getting the power of attorney in Spain or getting it in your home country? Generally, in the home country, it's more expensive because okay. the notary will see, the notary public that you visit in, in Germany, in the UK, in the States, wherever, is going to see that as the foreign, something that they don't normally do. And when some a professional encounters something they don't normally do, they normally charge more because it's going to be more risky and more dangerous for them. And, you know, initial work pays better. So it will be more expensive and the steps to be taken are longer. If you sign up a of attorney in Spain, it takes, I don't know, maybe, about an hour for the notary to be ready notaries are not too fast and and for you to sign it but that's the end of it you pay it you'll pay 150 euros or so for a full power of attorney with everything and and that will be it but if you pay it in your home country it can be that amount or twice and you still have to legalize it you have to send it to the foreign officer equivalent so they put an apostille of the Hague which is a stamp saying that the notary public is entitled to sign the power of attorney mm-hmm. and then you have to correct to post it here to Spain you know crossing your fingers so it's, it doesn't get lost it does not get lost often, but it does happen. And you've got so, to hope as well yeah. that the person that's doing it for you in your home country knows th- to cover everything that you will need for uh, the property or, or for buying a property in Spain. I, I suppose you go with the expertise in the, in the country that you're going to buy, I would say, anyway. Yes, and that's a very good point. What we normally do, at least in Pellicera and Heredia on those cases, we do provide the notary with a draft. I a see. draft of the power of attorney double column in Spanish and in English. Right. If the country is not an English-speaking country, for example, notaries in Poland are known for not signing documents that are not just in Polish, then it can be a little bit more complicated because you have to have the draft for the power done in Polish, which we have, of course, mm-hmm. but then it has to get translated back with a you know professional sworn translator and that has also a cost. Of course. Polish is an expensive language to translate from. So, you know, we're looking about another 200, 300 euros in, in costs. And actually, you mentioned Polish there. Uh, the uh, Polish economy, despite all of the uh, political issues it's been experiencing over the past year or so, uh, is actually doing quite well. In fact, doing better than Spain in, in, in some cases. So therefore, we've seen quite an influx of Polish buyers, haven't we? Especially on the Costa Blanca. I, I definitely agree. I think it's a combination of two things. First, you know, Ukraine is still 
Mm-hmm. As <laughs> as it is, so definitely that he yep. gives an impulse on the border with Ukraine. Of for, course, for Poland is yeah. right in the border, mm-hmm. so I'm sure people are thinking, oh, "What if Putin gets a missile wrong in the wrong turn and it arrives here?" And also, they have a lot of people coming, a lot of panic, tension, stress, and people, if they can, they want to live a, a life without stress. So we had an influx of people from Poland buying here, thinking, "Well, I think I'm going to winter here," because if you remember, on the first year of the war, there was a shortage of uh, fossil fuel. And Indeed. people were thinking that the heating was not going to be because we couldn't buy gas from Russia anymore. True. That you couldn't get heating. And here, when it's winter, you may get in the low single digits, maybe. But yeah, the houses could be quite cold here, Antonio. Yeah, Come on, you know that. But <laughs> think about Poland. Yeah, absolutely. In deep yeah. winter, there was a big difference in in, in fuel. Yeah, absolutely. So we got a lot of people buying here, and I think they've loved it. The country is. In good shape uh, financially, it looks like. So we had a big influx of, of young people, Polish professionals buying a second well, home. Well, yeah, post-pandemic, we have that situation anyway oh, with, with the Nomad visa. That's so, true. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely true. Talking about property, and um, you've gone into an area which I don't really know very much about for our second uh, part of the chat today. And you're talking about different types of property and uh, specifically older properties, which have perhaps different types of plumbing and so on. I didn't know this is something that, that you know, a lawyer would end up dealing with. Well, you could be surprised. <laughs> but yes, technically, if you buy a property, one of the as part of the due diligence, you have to find out if it's connected to the mains or not. So if it has water, water supply, or it's connected to the sewage system. If it is, then, well, that's probably the end of my job. Uh, and I guess, so, yeah, in, in, uh, with an apartment, you don't really generally worry about that because it's in town. That's or, true. You know, if it's on a, a big urbanisation, generally it's of all course. linked up. But if, yes. you, if you're looking, looking at sort of uh, more rural areas... That's right, yes. And not only more rural, but here in Javi, if you go to El Tosalet or some parts, which is technically not really the campo, as you could think about <laughs> Jalón or, yes. you know, or Giber or one of the Castel de Castells or one of the um, uh, cities that are towns that are inland... We hear even in Javier you can find plenty of properties really? that are not connected to the mains. So that's what has to be one of the things. But yeah, as you said, an apartment is not an issue. Mm. But if you're buying a, a plot, you know, with you have a single family house, a chalet, or yes, a country house, something like that, you have to know. If it's connected to the water and the sewage, then that's more or less the end of it. I Lawyers normally for the due diligence don't get into how the plumbing inside the house is generally. But let's imagine it's not, right, for the sake of the argument, because if not, then... We finish with the topic. Yeah. Let's imagine the, the property doesn't have a water connection. Then that, obviously, in Javier, I don't think you will find, but you can find it in Jiva or something like that. If that is the case, then you have to install a water tank, right? Mm-hmm. But the water, ta- the water tank may be already installed at the property when you buy it. But the problem is the code, the, the urban code that allows you which kind of a structure you can have or you cannot have. It's and a structure that goes underground, presumably. Aha! Uh-huh. That's true. Now they have to go underground. They have to have a specific, you know, characteristics so the water that's contained inside remains sterile, I guess, or, you know, drinkable water at least. Mm-hmm. But there's plenty of them that they used to be done years ago with a special insulation and they're placed not exactly on top of the land, but, you know, they they, they protrude, they... they Above, raise up a little ground, bit, yeah. Yeah, a little bit. So mm. it's like having a half out, and those most of those are not up to code, which means that technically the property that you're going to buy won't get. And here this a second occupation license, which is one of these papers that you need to or you should get to when you buy a property. I'll talk more about this in a second, mm-hmm. but that's half of it. The other half is well, how do you get the water in and how do you get it out when it's used? The classic system is the soak away, right? I call it here Pozo Negro or Foso Negro. So that so is... Dark water. Yeah. Uh, brown water, we call it. Yeah, British, that's yeah. right, brown water. That's right. So that is just kind of a place in which you put the brown water in and then either it lets it out or you filter something. Or That can work perfectly well and be okay for you for usage, but it's probably 95% sure not up to code. Again, that will prevent you from having the second occupation license. Instead of that, you should have a different thing installed in. 
either a septic tank, which is just, you know, like, not plastic, but, you know, plastic thingy, that you install underground and it gets the water, the brown water in, it does not get anything out, and then you get a service once or twice per year, depending on the usage, to come in, you know, clean it or whatever, and then go away. That's the cheapest version, and it requires maintenance, which is a little bit of a drag, but, you know, it will get you up to code, and it won't sink you too much in depth. The fancy thing, I don't know the name in English, but in Spanish it's called tanque de oxidación total. The What it does, which probably where the explanation... Sounds like the oxidization word is in there. Right? Yeah. When he's in the studio, we're looking for his Spanish translation here, but right. he's, he's, he's too, he's too uh, involved in filming. I think, uh, <laughs> anyway, so the, this thing is a more complex machine. So it has, in fact, electricity in it, and it's a machine. You put the brown water in one end, it does process that, it's magic, and then on the other side, it comes a little bit of a sludge, let's say, which is perfectly fine to be in the land. That is the thing. That what the code uh, asks for people to do now, for, to having their property greener and not pollute the land where it's in, which with a soak away, it looks like that's going to be the case. I see. Now, the second occupation license we're talking about, what's that about? Yeah, why is it a second occupation? Right. <laughs> when you build a house for the very first time, it's a brand new house, you get a habitation certificate, cédula de habitabilidad in Spanish, mm -hmm. but after 10 years, it expires. And generally, you get that renewed and the document has several names, but the classic name or the one that everybody knows it for, although it can take several forms, is the second occupation license. Right. And that is worth for several things. On, a, on some instances, you needed to change the utilities. In other instances, you need it, and for sure, for the tourist license. Ah. Aha. So there you go. So if you buy a house and say, oh, this is going to be a great investment, it's a slightly off the road, you know, and it's not connected to the, to the mains, but, you know, it's just beautiful. And it has, you know, two stories. I can rent it to a family. I'm going to make a killing. I need a tourist license. What a soak away what? And I cannot get the license for what? And I have to spend how much? If you do your due diligence before, you have already probably told the agent that you really want to, what you want the property for, and you want to rent it out, or you, you know, you have, you want to change the electricity or whatever, then the agent should have told you, should, but probably they didn't, to tell you how about the water and, and uh, sewage situation is. But if not, if you don't have an independent lawyer, you end up buying it as is, then you are the one that has, going, uh, has got to foot the bill to replace that in order to get the second occupation. So this is kind of where it would go wrong if you were perhaps to say just use the lawyer that the people who are selling the property are right. using. Because we, heard, we hear about this, though. Well, I guess we hear about everything, but yeah. yes, I, I, that's a bad idea. You should get your own independent lawyer, mm -hmm. somebody that will work just for you, not for the agent, not for the seller, for yeah. you. When a client comes to me and tells me, Antonio, I love this property, can I buy it? And then I'll take a look, and my reply won't be based on how starry the eyes of the buyer are. If it's, you know, if it's full of dreams, no. It's going to be dry fact. It's like, yeah, I shouldn't buy it. I, it has got these and these and these. If you buy it, you have to pay these. Or it cannot be bought because it's dangerous. The client may, you know, think it twice. I won't carry the way. Is how life is. I prefer for a person not to buy a property that cannot really be sold, you know, safely. Or if they do... They have to uh, do it fully informed of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm perfectly fine with a client buying a, pro a property I've told them not to buy because now they know. So they are buying something, you know, adjusting the price or their expectations or whatever. So they may need to change the sewage system to the, to the new one that you were highlighting, but um, they at least know that it's not got it's got one of the older systems. In, That's in place, right, but yeah. you balance both options. You think, well, but it is a really good price. If I had to spend an extra six, seven, eight thousand euros to update the soak away into a septic tank, still it's worth it. Or maybe not. Maybe yeah. you're on a tight budget and you really need it, or you know, you really it's upsetting for you to think that this agent that was so nice to you, invited you to dinner and drinks for a couple of days, you know, dine and wind you, as they say, and now they ruthlessly stabbed you in the back.
by not telling you this information. So some drawbacks then, if you're buying an older property or something that's a little bit further out than the uh, the mainstream um, and things that you definitely want to make sure that your lawyer looks at uh, before you sign anything. That's right. There's always there's always something. I have a, a joke with one of the, the people at the firm, Tamsin. Uh, whenever I do a, a conveyance with her, I will say, oh, this one looks like it's going to be an easy one. And she always berates me, said, don't say that, Anthony. There's always something. And there is. There's always something. Either there's a problem with the cellar, there's a problem with the house. It could be the soak away, the septic tank, the community of owners. There's a mortgage. There's an embargo on the property. could be anything. So you always have to, even if it looks like a simple purchase, there is such there is no such thing. Talking about different uh, things to do with property, and Dave has asked, he said that, I'm a property owner, I don't want my children to sell the house, they love it here anyway, and they'll keep it and share it. My question is, how do I transfer the house to them? Are there taxes when it's transferred and not sold? That's an excellent question. You can do that, definitely. You could give your property away as a gift to your kids. It will, they, pay, they will pay taxes. Well, you will pay taxes on their behalf because technically it's free for them, depending on how many kids you have and how much the property is worth. But from the, you know, from the top of my head, I don't think that's the best solution. I think the best solution would be for you to put the property in the will or just make a will in which you state that, that you want the property to be divided equally among your children. I understand understand that the, that the person that made the question is British, so that means mm-hmm. that they can do whatever they want with the will, and uh, they'll get a better tax exemption. If the person that owns the property is uh, gives it to a family member like the kids, they'll get €100,000 free of tax each of the kids. So if it's two kids and the property is worth €200,000, then there's no tax. If the person uh, bequeathing, giving away the property, you know, on the will, uh, it's a Spanish resident, not Spanish national, but resident here, pay the taxes and they do the renta, by the way, remember the deadline, (laughs) (laughs) and so on, then on top of the 100,000 euros, if they live at the property, each one of the heirs will get extra 150,000 euros off the tax base if they keep the property at least for five years. So that looks like it's going to be the best solution for David mm-hmm. because he says the kids don't want to sell the property. So even if they hasn't have only one kid or two and the property is really, you know, mm, a, a, a expensive property, they'll probably pay either no tax or a very low amount of tax. It's 250,000 euros discount per person inheriting. So that's quite a lot. Sounds like good news, doesn't it? Absolutely. And uh, we'll pass on your details so that uh, Dave can get in touch if he wants to find out more about that. Thanks, Antonio. Um, you, you wanted to talk a little bit about, so we've got a bit of time to uh, mention tourist licenses. Yeah. Alicante City, Altea, Valencia City perhaps next are uh, bringing in some new rules. That's right. It has all this, well, this is a conversation that's been, we've been having every year since 2018, in which the first ones, there were Barcelona with the new mayor they had back in the day, decided that enough was enough, and there were strikes and campaigns against, you know, massive, turi- uh, massive tourists. And we've are, seen it in number of, the different parts of the country recently. That's again, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Valencia is complaining about the cruise ships. They said that they got too many, and people come to you with these mega boats, and that's what they want to ban, you know, the mega boats being able to land in in Valencia and drop several thousand people in one day, which obviously wreaks, I guess, wreaks havoc in the in the city. Altea, what's done is they've closed off the tap on giving tourist licenses. To obtain a tourist license, you know, just to summarize, is different in every county. So Comunidad Valenciana has one system, Mallorca and the islands have another one, and Catalonia has another one, and so on and so forth. But the one that we have here in Alicante is a two-step program. You get first uh, approval by the town hall that you can get a license and then you send it to the Valencia central government and they'll give you the license then. But what the, the, the town halls are doing is selecting which neighborhoods, or in the case of Altea, the whole city, they are going to give them the approval for. So Altea has decided for the one year, at least, you know, while they'll think things over and they, they, they decide if it's right for them to issue more licenses, that they're closing off entirely giving licenses out. 
Please, this is just for one year so far. Who mm -hmm. knows what will happen in the future? And it does not affect if you currently have a license. Let's imagine you have a house in Altea, which has happened to us recently, by the way, and you are looking to sell it and the property, or you're looking to buy it, and the property already has a license. Then that means nothing because you can get the license changed to the new owner regardless of their prohibition by the town hall because changing the ownership of the license that does not require the approval by the town hall. It's just the Valencia government they want to decide and they haven't said anything about well, transferring. Well, I guess it's something that we're going to be talking about quite a bit oh, more yeah. in the future because it'll change. But um, yes, Antonio yes. is the property expert at Pelletier and Heredia, as I mentioned, alicantilawyers.es. And uh, you can uh, see the website in various different languages there. Been great to talk to you, Antonio, today. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, very pleasure. interesting. And I've learned quite a bit that I didn't know. <laughs> An Thank absolute you. pleasure.